My name is Floyd Maxwell. My father's name was Ray Maxwell, and my granddad was Robert Maxwell. He always went by R.G. Maxwell. But uh, we didn't. We got here in 1899. But to start a little bit ahead of that, my great grandparents, who was Philemon and Alta Hahn, came to Fort Collins basically by covered wagon. And they bought a farm on the west side of Fort Collins. I'll get down a little further. I'll show you a map of Fort Collins, which was a very small area compared to what it is today. So anyway, uh, the great-grandparents probably came to Fort Collins by covered wagon. And then they settled on the west side of Fort Collins and started farming. They farmed there real nice, I guess, for about 10 years. But in early 1899, Mr. Hahn, my great-grandfather, died. And his wife, basically a housewife, probably didn't know very much about farming or how to go out in the field and plow and plant and so forth. So she contacted my grandfather, who had been farming in western Iowa for a number of years. And presumably she asked him to come to Fort Collins and run their farm. So he loaded up a bunch of couple of wagons with farm equipment, tools, hammers, shovels, and so forth. And the other wagon, probably with some furniture, pots and pans, dishes, silverware, and clothing for all of the family. And probably enough food in that one wagon to last a week. And uh, when they got the wagons all loaded, they hooked their mules to each wagon and went down to the railroad station and loaded all of it onto the railroad. The railroad then took them to Greeley, Colorado. There was no railhead in Fort Collins, so Greeley was the closest place. Anyway, they got to Greeley. Question? I live in Greeley. What? Oh, good. All righty. But anyway, then they unloaded everything, hooked their mules to their covered wagon. I guess be, there's a picture of my grandfather and grandmother. Next one. So this is their covered wagon that they started out from the railroad in Greeley, Colorado. And then they headed toward Fort Collins, probably at the rate of about 10 miles an hour. So it would probably take them at least three days, maybe four days to get to Fort Collins. And after then they got to Fort Collins, they went over next to the Han farm and there happened to be some land available, and so my granddad bought another 80 acres to go with it. So by now he had a pretty good sized farm. And uh, as time kind of rolled along, he had this two-story brick house built, and they lived in that until they died. But anyway, they had the house built, and then they built the barn, for which they put their cattle in. And that's the barn and the silo. And then they built corrals on behind it so they could keep their animals in an area, not let them run all over the country. So then they built their corrals that way. And uh, <clears throat> after they got that all done and everything, then this is the map of Fort Collins 
in 1899. Yes? What did they do with the animals when they died? <sighs> I'm sorry, I don't know. They never told me what they did with them, so I don't know what. I have no idea. Maybe they took them out in the field somewhere and buried them. I don't know. They never told me. And I wasn't smart enough, I guess, to ask. Okay? <laughs> anyway, that's the size of Fort Collins. This one line down the middle here is College Avenue. And so it's four or five blocks that way and so forth. Was the size of Fort Collins in 1899. Today it goes clear over to the foothills, goes about 10 miles toward Loveland, goes over to I-25, and goes north up to the Y, where the Wellington Road takes off. So it is much bigger today than it was back in 1899. <clears throat> now this is a picture of Fort Collins in about 1899. I don't remember there's a date on it. But anyway, that was what Fort Collins looked like. Horses and wagons, horses and buggies, saddle horses. That was their mode of transportation at that time. Automobiles weren't invented until 1905 or somewhere there. This is just another picture of Fort Collins as you can barely see the wagons along the street and so forth. And uh, again, another picture. More wagons, more buggies, but that's how they all lived and got around in Fort Collins. <clears throat> this is a picture of a grocery store at about that same time. It was very similar to that when I was about 10 years old in about uh, 1935. They had the shelves up the back where they had all the food supplies, canned items, and so forth. And usually they had a little aisle between the shelves and counter space out in front. In the counters was glass covered and they had other things that needed to be protected from the average citizen that was in that way and they kept it covered for good food quality and usually in front of that counter they had little shelving along the way and they had small barrels of maybe flour, sugar, rice, beans, other items that way and that was the stores in the early 1900s. That's another picture. You can see them standing behind the counter and the shelves on the wall. Grocery stores are a lot different today. But that's it. And then uh, as time progressed and so forth, um, my granddad R.G. Maxwell, about that time, was at 1904. And the farmers kind of was getting together to figure out what to do and talk about their problems and so forth. And uh, then they uh, built this, well, Granddad gave them an acre of land to build this building on, which then is called the Grange Hall. And they could go in there, meet, hold their meetings, talk about their problems. And then some of them would go out into town and try to find the best place to buy food, buy coal that was used for heating and cooking, get beans, get other products, apples, so forth, and buy clothing. And so from there, they did that. And I guess worked out really quite well. And about that same time, then my grandfather, I guess, accumulated enough money till he bought 160 acres of land over by the foothills. That's where the big A is. But he bought that land. And uh, then the college, which was known as Colorado A&M College, 
The A and M stood for Agricultural and Mechanical College. Yes. Can you see the A in winter? Yes. Well, if there's not a foot of snow on top of it, yes, you could see it. But if it's all covered up with snow, no, nope, you can't see it. <laughs> so anyway, my granddad then owned all of that land on the mountain and down below it for pasture land. And he put a bunch of cattle over there on the pasture. And then the executives of Colorado A&M College wanted to build that big A on the hill. And they chose that hill because it was just about due west of the college campus. Could be very well seen, showed up good, was a great place. So then they came to my grandfather and said, hey, we'd like to build an A up there to stand for agriculture. And they worked out things and my granddad said, yeah, I'll do it for you. I will give you permission to build the A, maintain it, keep it painted and so forth for 99 years at one dollar. That's all he charged them. <laughs> so that's how the A got started. Yes? Um, does the A ever fade, uh, fade away and then you guys repaint it? Uh, Yes, I'm just coming to that, but yes, when the college first had it built, then I guess they painted it at that time, and they used a substance that's called lime. It's a white powder, and you mix it with water, and it kind of looks like paint, and if you put, it's thick and so forth, if you put too much water in it, it gets too thin but then they can paint the A, the rocks, with that. And in the first years, the freshman class had to go paint the A. They were done that way. And they had little beanie caps, just little round beanies that set on their head. They had to wear those and go up to the A, mix up the lime, and paint the rocks. That went along good for a good many years until after World War II. And then all of the GIs, the veterans, all came home and wanted to go to college. <laughs> but they flat refused to wear the little beanies or go paint the A. So that all quit. Now there's volunteer groups that go up and paint the A. I think they use regular paint now because it lasts a lot longer. But that's how they painted it at that time. And they paint it by hand. They don't use airplanes. That's too hard to paint. And at the A, they'd only, they couldn't turn the air on and spray it that quick and shut it off. So it's all done by hand all the time. And uh, <clears throat> so that went on. The A, they rolled rocks into place. They're all over the hill. So they rolled them into place, made the A. It is 210 feet wide, and it's 400 feet tall. It's a big A. <laughs> anyway, that then went on for a good many years until my grandparents died. And then my father, Ray Maxwell, inherited the land and became owner of it. And he grazed cattle on it for a good many years until 1975. And at that time, he kind of got tired and felt like he didn't want to have the pasture anymore. so. It was A&M a College at that time, but as recently years, since about 1950, it has become Colorado State University. So in 75, when my dad wanted to sell it, 
he went to the college officials and said, I don't want it anymore. I want to sell it. Will you buy it? They said, no, we don't want to buy the whole 160 acres of land. All we want is to maintain the A. So they worked it around and whatnot and finally worked a deal with the city of Fort Collins. And the city bought the 160 acres and then they gave the rights for Colorado State University to maintain and paint the A. So that's how that all went then. So granddad had it first and then my dad had it. We sold it so I don't have it anymore. But Colorado State University takes care of the A, paints it, keeps it in good shape and so forth that way. And the city's got the other part of the land. And today they call it Maxwell Natural Area. It's kind of like a state park, or in case of this, it would be city park, but it's not like the city park down here. And but they, as far as I know, allow every, anybody, everybody to walk up there, look it over, see the area, look at the A, and come back home. So that's about it for the A. And in the meantime, my folks, Ray and his wife, bought a 160-acre farm just north of Bellevue, Colorado, which is just up the road here a little ways. And on that farm was this house. It was built in 1880, about 135 years ago. That's a long time but it was made of sod, if you can believe it. Not a wood frame house or a brick house. It was made of sod. So presumably the man who built it went down in his place with a kind of a big plow and plowed up all of this sod into pieces that was probably about that wide and in pieces of that long. And then he put it on his wagon, hauled it up here and built his house. And they would pile it up. Like that. And make the sod house walls. The walls were about that thick. Of this dirt and grass piled up to the top of the house. And that's when I was born, that's where I lived, was inside of this sod house. The outside of it was looked just like this. And when it rained or snowed and froze, it began to deteriorate. And so then they hired a person to come and they put really fine mesh chicken wire over the front edge of it. And then they coated that with what they called stucco. It was a concrete mixture of water and sand. There were no rocks in it. And they coated that to keep it from deteriorating anymore. And there, at that time, in 1926, and then I was born in 1929, we had no electricity, nothing whatsoever. So we didn't have any electric lights, no refrigerators, no kitchen tools or anything. And we only had kerosene lamps to see by and kerosene lamp lanterns to go out into the barn to milk cows. Now I'd like to show you the lamp, if I may, a little bit here. I 
burned way back then. We didn't have cigarette lighters. All we had was matches. I don't know whether you've seen matches or not, but they're phosphorus on the end of the tip and a little stick and you hold that and then we would say at night when we got done with the chores and come in to eat supper my mother would put this lamp in the middle of the table and our plates around the table and we would sit there and eat supper. And so that was our light. I've seen those things at restaurants. Uh -huh. So that was our light to see and eat supper by. And even when I was in high school and we had lessons to do and books to read and so forth, that was all we had to read by. We would put that in front of us and our books here and we'd read books. But that's all the light that we had to read by and eat supper by and so forth. And the same way with the kerosene lanterns. They had kerosene, which was more flammable, and now I got lamp oil. But we used these lanterns when we went out to milk cows in the cow barn. We hung up about four of them along the way, hung them on a wire so that the cows couldn't knock them over and start a fire. But we used those to light up the cow barn and we milked cows with a lantern that made a light about like that. It's a lot different today with electricity. Okay. Now you just go flip a switch. <laughs> yes. Okay, hold on to your questions. I want the lamps on. Me too. Can you, you will answer questions at the end, okay? I okay. Promise. Okay, that's how we had lights in our old sod house. <clears throat> okay, and that's some pictures of the lamps that we have that I've just kept over the years to show today too. And that's the little lantern that does that with that way. And this is a picture of an old gasoline pump that usually was in front of most grocery stores. There was one like that at the Bellevue grocery store and uh, two or three of them at the Laporte grocery store. And uh, <clears throat> right here is the handle that when you go in and tell the store manager that you wanted gasoline, he would come out, pump up the gas that would flow up into here, and these tanks usually held 10 gallons worth of gasoline, and you get whatever you wanted, and then he would put the nozzle into the gas tank, squeeze it, and let the gas all run out. But that was the gas pumps around the early 1900s and 1930s. This one I just put in to show farmers out in the field with horses and this happens to be raking hay with a, what they called a dump rake. You, they drug it along the teeth until they got a pretty good bunch of hay cluttered up in there. Then they would step on a little lever and it would trip and then you go get some more in that way. And that's how the farmers kind of got started with their hay. They would mow it, let it get dry, rake it into piles, and then push it down and put it into a haystack. So it was a lot of work in farming. And then this is pictures here a little bit of when they got along and the farmers had their grain already and they would then have it thrashed. And this is a threshing machine. I don't know whether any of you have seen one of those in operation, but a lot of the farmers would stack 
the grain bundles fairly close together and then they would pull the threshing machine in between it and pitch the bundles into the front part of the machine and that thrashed the grain. Then the straw blew out in that big tube in the back and the grain came out here and dumped into the truck or a wagon or whatever. My grandpa has one of those. Oh, good. So this is just a different picture looking at how they put the end of the front of the machine and then the thrashes it, puts the straw out in the straw pile. These happen to be sacking the grain, putting it in burlap sacks instead of a wagon. But, and there's little bundles of grain there. That's how they did their farming back in the early days. And wow, here is the streetcar. I guess you've all seen it, have you? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, in the earlier days, Fort Collins didn't have any railway system, basically. They used horses, wagons, and all of that. And then in 1919, they went to Denver and they found these trolleys at a railway station. And they bought, as near as I know, somewhere around five or six of them. How they got them to Fort Collins, I never, never found out. But anyway, they came to Fort Collins and then they laid the streetcar tracks around the city so that these streetcars could give people a ride to work and around and home again and so forth that way. So this is just another picture of the streetcar. Okay, that's most of mine. Now then some of the questions. Wait, how is the fire not moving? It looks fake a little. It, do, it doesn't look like it's moving. What? It doesn't, it doesn't look like it's The glass keeps it in. Yeah. It can't move. The glass moves so Okay. So I'll answer some of your questions that you have that your teacher gave me, and then if we got more time, I'll answer your questions. And one of them here, the first one says, do I like Aggies? Yes, I, when I was going to college, I went to a, a number of the games, uh, football games, basketball games, and so forth. And it wasn't, they didn't go by Aggies until Colorado State or Colorado A&M got a football team and then they became Aggies. So that's why they just built the A and not spell out Aggies on the hill. And it says, do, do all the Maxwells live here? No, we're scattered everywhere. We've got relatives scattered in uh, well, I've got a brother in Albuquerque. I've got a son in Phoenix, Arizona. I've got a cousin in Alaska. And they've got some of their children in Australia. And uh, we've got some people in Windsor. We've got two boys that do farming up around Red Feather Lakes. Got a daughter in Salt Lake City. Got a cousin in Canyon City. And they're scattered everywhere else, probably from Mississippi to Michigan, from coast to coast. So we're scattered everywhere. And uh, where did we live before we came here? Well, my grandparents lived in Iowa. And then all the rest of us, well, my father was there too, and he was a little boy when they came here. And so, but basically we have lived in and around here all the rest of the time. And uh, how did they travel? Mostly by covered wagon. Did they have lots of children? Uh, my grandparents had six boys. One of them was my father. And the others were just five other boys. Three of those became farmers. One worked for a big corporation in San Francisco, 
And uh, I'm not sure where the other one worked. He kept moving around. Uh, so we didn't stay in Fort Collins hardly at all. A lot of everybody did. And so that's kind of some of your questions there. Uh, you say, and how long has the A been there? Well, it was built in 1923, and that means it was about 92 years ago that it was built. Then my great-grandma was born when the A started. She's 92. Okay, uh-huh. Uh, whose idea was it? Well, it was the college officials that wanted to put the A on the hill to represent Colorado agriculture. And that's how they built the A that way. Uh, who paints it today? It's just volunteer people. Back when it was first built, all the freshmen had to paint it. And when do we paint it? Uh, used to be they painted it in the fall of every year. Today, they're using, I guess, better quality paint and so forth that doesn't wash off, so they don't paint it near as often but they do keep it in pretty good shape and it sh shines. How did they get the rocks there? Well, I'm sorry, but I don't know that question either. I suppose they had a bunch of pretty strong boys and they just rolled the rocks over into place. Anyway, and another little deal. Uh, when uh, Colorado Agricultural College was playing uh, Colorado Mines in Golden. They kind of had little fights among themselves and whatnot. And early one year, some people from Colorado Mines came up and planted dynamite all over the A, fixing to blow it to pieces. But fortunately, very, very little of it worked for some reason and only a few pieces of dynamite went off, and it saved the A. Quite a deal. Why did what? I don't remember when that was. Uh huh. And can you hike on the A over there? As far as I know, yes, since it is classed as Maxwell Open or Nature Open Space. So I think it's open and you can, can go up there. Do I have a dog? No, I don't have. But as a little boy, about like you, we had a bulldog. And he was quite a lovable little dog. He could roll all over him and love him and everything. And he just laid there and slept. So that was my first dog. After he died, we had a little black and white wire hair terrier. He didn't like that too much, but he was a good little dog and we played with him and had a good time. But since I live here in town, I don't have a dog. <clears throat> and how, how long have I lived here? Well, I lived and grew up the first 22 years of my life in Bellevue, Colorado, on the farm. And then when I became of age, the Army decided they needed me, and they called me in, and I then became a soldier, got trained, went to Korea, and was an auto mechanic for two years, came home. And then I went to college for two years, got a degree, and then went to work for the Woolworth Company. And then I was in Idaho Falls, Salt Lake City, Rollins, Wyoming, back to Salt Lake City, down to a little town of Orem, Utah, and then Inglewood, California. Left them, came back to Denver and started working for Montgomery Wards. Came to Fort Collins and worked for Montgomery Wards. Then worked for J.C. Penney Company for a while. And then I got tired of all of that and went to Country General Farm Store, which is like Jack's Farm Store out north of town, 
and I worked there for 18 years. But it wasn't until I came to Fort Collins again that I came to my home here in Fort Collins, and I've been here for about 40 years. Uh, how many children do I have? I have four children. Lynette is one of them. And I have four grandchildren. And that's about it right now, so. And what it was like in Fort Collins when I was born, some of those early pictures was kind of what it was like. Uh, I came along in 1929, and they did have automobiles in that time, so there weren't, weren't near as many horses and wagons, but there still was a few wandering around. Okay, any questions? Second, please, just a second. And Mr. Mike said you promised he would edit me out. If you've been asking questions all along, unfortunately, the camera couldn't pick up your voice because you didn't have a microphone. I got one. Saving questions till the end. This microphone will pick up your voice. Okay. So if you have your hand raised and you have not already asked a question, questions are like you're looking for information, not telling, yeah, what, where, not telling a story. You have to have this for the camera to see your voice. Okay. Let's try to get people from some different classes, and if you've already asked a question, you need to put your hand down and let somebody else have a turn. I see a lot of hands. Ask any questions seen. where Mr. Maxwell has already told us the answer, because we were really good listeners, so we're right. going to ask new questions. We'll start back here with Roman, and then Roman, when you're done with this, you can pass it on to the next person, okay? Can you stand up? Stand up, Roman, when you ask your question. What happens if um, one of the one of, what happens if um, uh, it, um, a lamp goes out? Well, if the lamp goes out, that's usually because you ran out of, in our old days, kerosene. Today it would be lamp oil, and if it runs out, goes out, chances are it is out of the fuel. And so all you need to do is go get more fuel. Uh, we, at, at home in the sod house, we usually had a gallon can of kerosene, and that we kept filling the lights. And when the can got empty, we went down to the store, got more kerosene, came home, and we were ready to fill lamps as needed. Next. The what? The the rocks falls down. Uh, that I don't really know. They're pretty good sized rocks and I probably will not roll. So they pretty well stay in place. And as near as I know, that A has been there and in good shape for 90 some years. Um, did um, any of your ancestors like R.G. Maxwell no anti stone? Uh, possibly did, yes. I don't know for sure. I guess I never asked them if they did. But she was around Fort Collins at the time that my grandfather came in and should have heard about her quite a little bit. Where do I get what? Your resources from. My resources? The pictures, the information. Oh, my information. Well, I guess I was one of those people that were really interested in history. And so I got most of it probably from newspaper clippings. And then in, uh, I forget when, but the city celebrated their 125th year. 
and they put out a little magazine of seven or eight pages, and I got a lot of that information out of that little newspaper deal that way. And I've been saving it all over, and I've got lots of newspaper clippings of a lot of areas of Fort Collins and around and so forth. What's your question? I've been to the letter, letter A, and how strong were the houses? And how long, how strong was what? The house. The sod house. How strong was the sod house? Oh, well, the sod house was built in 1880, and it was still standing in pretty good shape by 1950. So somewhere around 135 years, and it was still standing. So it was pretty well put together. What did you sleep on? Uh, time I was born, uh, they had had a pretty well regular beds with mattresses and box springs and blankets and so forth that way. And so we would go upstairs into the sod house and when they kind of let the fires die down at night, it got pretty cold up there. So we slept under a whole bunch of blankets, but we stayed pretty warm, but regular beds and blankets and mattresses and so forth. <coughs> Pick, pick your first one. Pick the most important question. Yeah. You only get one. What happened if the store ran out of kerosene? <sighs> I guess we never ran out, or they never did in that way, but where we had a store in Bellevue that sold kerosene, and there was a store in Laporte, not, not only a couple of miles apart. Uh, I guess if one store ran out, we'd go to the other one. But uh, we never, at home, we never ran out of kerosene. We made pretty <coughs> sure that we had a good supply to keep our lamps going. Um, um, did your, like, one of your family members know Avery Franklin? who built the Avery House? Uh, presumably, yes. Because Granddad came in 1899, and he lived until he was 93 years old, and so probably knew most of those type people in Fort Collins. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maxie, can you give it to Davis? And I think that needs to be our last question. Okay, so hands down, my friends. Um, how long did it take to build the house? That, I have no idea. Uh, it was, like I say, the folks that had the farm before built it in 1880, and I don't know how long it took them to build it, but when I was born in 1929, some 10, 20, 30 years later, it was still standing in good shape, and lasted until about 1950 when I was about 20, 24 years old. So it lasted a long time. Presumably that they put some, sprinkled some water between each layer to let them kind of mesh together and stay matted and they built the house. I don't know, other than that, I'm just guessing that's how they did it. Okay? Alrighty. Boys and girls, what do we need to say to our special visitors? Thank you. You're welcome. We're